You're listening to the Two Guys and One Gun podcast here at Guns.com. What's going on, y'all? This is Alexander and Mr. Chris Eager with the Two Guys, One Gun podcast brought to you by Guns.com. And uh, today we are joined by Mr. Owen and Mr. Knox. I'm going to let you guys do a little introduction and, uh, you know, kind of tease what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm Knox Williams, uh, the executive director of the American Suppressor Association. Uh, for anybody who's not aware of who we are, we're the nonprofit uh, advocacy group for the suppressor community. So that's industry, consumers alike. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance because I am going to have to step out. I got a contractor at my house fixing a garage door. Um, so here until that guy comes and then I'll be back as soon as I can. And we've nice. also got uh, Owen Miller with uh, ASA with us as well. Yeah, I'm Owen Miller. I'm the vice president for the American Express for Association. Uh, I've been with the association uh, almost eight years now, and then uh, spent the better part of a decade before that with uh, with a major suppressor manufacturer out of Idaho. So I've been in this game for going on almost two decades now. That's awesome. And for those of you who don't know, uh, I believe, I, if I heard you correctly, Mr. Owen is one of the reasons why get the fast turnarounds on those uh those <clears throat> forms these days for for can so big thank you to you you guys obviously have a huge impact on the suppressor community um and, and you know the involvement of, of suppressors with the nfa but we want to talk about suppressors in general um their growing popularity i mean me and eager have talked about in our opinion from a guns.com perspective it's it's the hottest fastest growing thing in the in the industry right now um you know a little bit of the the origin where suppressors come from and uh, maybe some of the the misnomers or you know concepts that people have around suppressors that keep them from ownership uh but we'd love to just dig in so one of you guys wants to start off with a little bit uh starting off with the history of suppressors where they come from and uh you know kind of where they're at today yeah, that seems like a Knox question. I mean, he's yeah. he's our uh, resident uh, guy with a degree in history. So, uh, <laughs> Knox, you, you seem to know it well. Why don't you jump in on that one? Yeah, I mean, the history is uh, it's, it's kind of more recent than you think, right? Um, gentleman that invented them is named Hiram Percy Maxim. He uh, filed his first patent in 1908. It was approved in 1909. Um, he called it the silent firearm. Um, and for him, he was just this, like, uh, like, pretty established inventor son of Hiram Stevens Maxim who invented uh, the machine gun his uncle uh, I think that's the contractor uh, that's so right. let me step out <laughs> uh, you, uh, you go ahead and take this one I'll be back here in a little bit no worries yeah so I'll uh, I'll just carry on where Knox left off so like you said uh, Hiram Percy Maxim uh, son of the uh, Hiram Stevens Maxim who invented the machine gun uh, patented the the Maxim silent firearm in 1909 and uh, it really was just kind of born out of his desire to uh, be able to shoot, which he enjoyed doing, and do so quietly without disturbing neighbors, without making as much noise. Um, and he was kind of a victim of his own marketing success. So, you know, fast forward to the the 1930s and the introduction of the National Firearms Act, and um, you know, he had marketed the, the silencer, what we know as a suppressor today, um, as this tool to shoot without noise was one way that he marketed it. And, and so in the thirties with gangland violence and, and prohibition, um, there was just a lot of misconceptions about suppressors and what they could or couldn't do. Um, and you would look back to kind of these sensational news stories that would say, like, you know, two people were murdered in an apartment and because no one heard the shot, then it's possible that a suppressor was used. And there was all, all of this kind of hyperbole and uh, just sensationalism that, that never really had any truth behind it, uh, but it, it, it was what got suppressors ensnared in the National Firearms Act in the 30s. And so that really kind of um, put a damper on the market for the next, you know, 80 plus years. And fast forward to 2011, when the American Suppressor Association was founded, um, there were only 285,000 suppressors in the entire registry 
Uh, so for for 1934 to 2011, only 285,000 suppressors were registered. And I mean, last year and the last couple of years, we've surpassed those numbers uh, in, in just individual years of new suppressors being registered and sold. Um, so they've really kind of hit that uh, stage of growth where the average gun owner is learning about suppressors and wanting to utilize them both for hearing protection and just, you know, more enjoyment of the sport. Absolutely. And, and we're, we're at over like 3 million, right? Uh, that are in the uh, NFA uh, uh, FTR. Yeah. Last number that we got out of ATF uh, in January of this year was uh, over 3.6 million. So I would suspect that this year we will surpass 4 million in the registry. Yeah, I remember I got my first one back in, in 2005, and it was it was kind of like the dark ages of suppressors back then. There was only, you know, it was like AAC and 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 TAC and, and Gym Tech and stuff, but that was really about it. You yeah. Know, um, there was really not a lot of people around uh, uh, back when I got my first one, and, uh, and that was at this point almost 20 years ago. You know, and it, everything it. was paper, and you had the Clio where you had to actually go down to the a uh, police chief and be like, well, I just want to suppress it. You know? <laughs> yeah. I love telling the story. I, you know, I kind of have a similar story of how I got in the market. I was a consumer first. I bought my first suppressor uh, in sometime around 2000 or 2001. And it was a Gemtech suppressor. They were kind of one of the big names at that time. There was a, a local law enforcement dealer that sold them. Um, but I actually ended up buying it through another SOT and it was in Washington State. Washington State had a weird like conflict in their state law where you could own a suppressor there, but you couldn't use it there, which they fixed uh, later on around 2011. Um, and like you said, it was there was this huge process that no one really understood. Like no one really knew about trusts back then. So I actually purchased mine through a nonprofit corporation because uh, people knew you could do a corporation to bypass the the Clio uh, signature requirement, the Clio sign-off. And the SOT that I bought mine from had a regular day job. He drove a concrete truck by day, and his licensed premise was the old, like, milking parlor from an abandoned dairy farm. It was like the <laughs> weirdest thing. You felt like you were doing something illegal, even though you weren't. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, I bought my first suppressor like after hours in a abandoned milking parlor of a dairy farm. And uh, that's and, and it took, I think, 14 months to get my my approval uh, for my first suppressor. And of course, by then I, I I had the bug. I was hooked. I bought quite a few more. Um, and then through kind of some fortunate accidents, ended up uh, connecting with uh with a suppressor company and getting hired on by them and, and spending almost 11 years there. So, uh, yeah, it's been a fun ride. Well, you know, um, we had, we've got our horror stories, you know, where, you know, months and years waiting all the paper forms and having to physically drive around town and, and, and talk to the local, uh, law enforcement and stuff and, and convince them that you're okay enough for them to sign off on this, uh, form, you know, just to exercise this, you know, uh you know extended right to keep and bear arms you know uh and and back then i remember you know i'd go to the range and i'd have a suppressor and there wasn't that many like you said there wasn't that many of them floating around you know like two hundred thousand at the time and so it was almost super exotic you know people would be like is, is that a silencer you know it's like well it's not really a you know a silencer you know it's a suppressor it's you know, you still hear it, you know, you can be way down on the other side of the range. You're still going to hear me shoot this, you know, pardon me. But uh, like the first reaction was like, aren't they illegal? You know, and it was like, no, they've never, ever been illegal. They've just been, you know, highly regulated since 1934. It used to be they were totally unregulated. You could just send it to you by the mail, you know, but, uh, you know, since 34, you know, they've had the kibosh on it and, you know, been highly regulated, lots of red tape and stuff. But uh, the one of the big reasons why we're having this uh, uh, this podcast is all that's kind of changed over the past uh, decade. You know, you, you've got the e-forms, you've got all this stuff, you've got the NFA branch doing a lot of stuff. And uh, so right now, instead of years, you know, 
waiting for your can to get out of suppressor jail and be able to actually go pick it up. Um, people are seeing super fast times now. Uh, you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is really a culmination of kind of a number of small events and a number of accomplishments um, by ASA and our, our sponsor companies that have worked with us and, and helped us lobby uh, to advance suppressor ownership. And I think it, it goes all the way back to you mentioning the, the first e-form system back in 2013, 2014. You know, that was that was kind of the first step forward in changing the way in which we we submit forms and the way in which we process forms uh, or that ATF processes those forms. It unfortunately was kind of a flawed system from the start. And, you know, as we all know, the history, it, it went offline um, about a year after they launched it. So in in. March, April timeframe of 2014, the e-form the e system was taken offline. And that started really ASA on a path of pushing constantly and consistently uh, to get a new e-form system launched. And, you know, every time we check with ATF, it was always imminent or it was coming in the next six months, but it it eventually it took almost 10 years to really see the launch of the new e-form system. And uh, as unfortunate as it was for it to take that long, credit where credit's due, they, they actually built a system that is not 100%, it's not without its flaws, but it's markedly better than the first system that they they launched. Um, in that time frame, we also had um, ATF 41F, which was that rule change of how trusts were handled. Um, you know, like you said, with the the Clio sign off, it it was sometimes a burden to get a suppressor, not because you know people didn't want background checks or fingerprints. It was just sometimes you just lived in a locale that you couldn't get a Clio sign off, and so utilizing trusts. Uh, was the way to to get around that, and so in in 2016, uh, ATF 41F was put into place that required the submission of fingerprints and photographs for trustees, um, and part of that was removal of the Clio sign off requirement and it moved to a Clio notification process, and that was just before. Uh, my time joining ASA. So I think Knox can kind of probably provide a little more detail on that process and what ASA's involvement was in that that change to the, the Clio process. Yeah, man, dude, that was a multi-year process, right? Like 41P came out, I believe, in early, uh, late 2013 or early 2014. Um, and one of the first things that we did was we organized a sit down with industry up in D.C., um, actually at NRA ILA headquarters on the Hill. Um, and, you know, we just kind of, we, we retained a lobbyist. Um, this was actually before we even had the budget to have a like salaried position with ASA. So that was about two and a half, three years into volunteering time on ASA. Here we are going hiring a contract lobbyist to work on the Hill for us. Uh, it turns out that contract lobbyist was a complete waste of money. Uh, we learned that lesson very early on that uh, a very effective way to light your money on fire is to hire somebody that doesn't care. Um, so we uh, we let that contract go for the six month term and we did not renew that one. Um, but um, yeah, we uh, we we found another lobbyist that uh, that was very effective um, and um, we started working with a an ATF fellow who was uh, working uh, in Senator John Bozeman's office, uh, I believe the Senator from, um, uh, see Arkansas, I think Bozeman's Arkansas. Um, and this ATF fellow and us, we basically hashed out verbiage for, uh, some appropriations language that we were planning on, uh, working through the appropriation cycle, uh, to basically curtail what ATF could and couldn't do with the final ruling. Um, <laughs> more or less exactly what we hashed out with that ATF fellow uh, ended up being the final rule uh, of 41F. And there was a couple things that were different, right? It was not a perfect final ruling, um, but 
the original intent of 41P was to actually extend uh, the CLIO sign-off requirement to everybody. So not just for individuals, but also for trust and legal entities. And we pushed back very hard on that. Um, and we're actually able to uh, get the administration, the Obama administration at the time to back off on it. Um, and that was uh, the biggest and the best thing that happened with that was the elimination of the CLIO requirement, um, which would, would have in effect created a de facto ban for a ton of people, um, right? And like, there's a lot of different chief law enforcement officers that people can uh, get a signature from. You know, it could be a sheriff, it could be a chief of police, it could be a, an attorney general, um, some judges uh, fall into that category. Um, but for a lot of people getting access to those folks is uh, time intensive, if not impossible. Um, so for us, that was really a, a pretty core, um, you know, objective was to make sure that you didn't have to have some, you know, elected or appointed official who has like, you know, uh, authority over your ability to exercise a Second Amendment right. Um, and that was, uh, yeah, that was a pretty big dog can, fight. Candidly, if, if I could, could interject on that, my first can I got back in, in 2005, you know, I went to my, my local uh, Clio and I really honestly felt that um, the only reason why I got okayed for it was because I had a, a sheriff's commission at the time with that agency, you yeah. know, because it was, it was really kind of uh, a thing where like, why do you want a suppressor? Are you trying to be an assassin or something? You know, it was, it was, it was just so backward and so Hollywood, you know, poisoned and, you know, everybody was just, you know, just if you know, that's the only reason why you would ever have a suppressor is if you're like some nefarious purpose, you're trying to, you know, sneak up on somebody and, and whatnot, you know, when of course it's, it's, it's hearing protection, it's, it's all sorts of stuff, you know? Um, and, and honestly, I'm sure a lot of people, you know, had their paperwork, had all their, their form four stuff, had their fingerprints and they went to the Clio, you know, uh, in, in different places. And they were like, for whatever reason, you know, you, you look funny or I just don't like you, or I just don't sign those. And they didn't get them, yeah. you know? Yeah. So yeah. that was, that was a big roadblock and it's a totally artificial bureaucratic roadblock, you know? Yeah. yeah it's, it's gatekeeping people's, <clears throat> you know, constitutional rights for sure. Uh, but real quick, just before we kind of get, a little bit deeper into this uh i'd love to just address some of the like i said there's some some misnomers about suppressors like uh eager was saying you know and, and a lot of that stuff seems to be in a way relegated to the united states and the u.s market um with I don't know, like this Hollywood video game idea of suppressors, whereas overseas in Europe, suppressors are seen in, in a lot of cases as a courtesy thing. It's like if you're going to go shooting outside, you shoot with a suppressor. If you're going to go hunting, you hunt with a suppressor so as not to add to noise pollution, um, which really goes back to Maxim's intent for the entire you know, existence of the, of the suppressor in the can. Um, but even before we get into that, I'd love just a brief rundown for people who don't know, start to finish right now, what does it take to get a suppressor? I think that that's one of the things that holds a lot of people back is it seems like this really overly complicated process. Uh, I don't even know where to start kind of thing. And, and I'd love just kind of a brief, like this is what you do and, and this is how we end up with, with, a, with a can. Yeah, um, you know, the process is really pretty simple. And and I think the biggest barrier for a lot of people to enter the market was the wait times, which are largely lately a thing of the past. Uh, you know, and that's not for everybody. We understand there are still people out there that are are delayed on their background check for whatever reason, even though they're they're not a prohibited person. But the the process is really pretty straightforward. It's it's a lot like getting a concealed weapons permit. Um, you know, you're going to go to your local dealer first, you're going to, um, find out which suppressor it is you want to buy. And there are certainly some online retailers as well that have vast dealer networks across the country that you can, so you can kind of do some of your research and shopping online. Um, but yeah, you're going to pick out what suppressor it is you want for, for the application that you want. And then, um, you're going to complete a, a form four. And in the old days, it was paper. Now it's all done electronically. So it's pretty simple process to go through with your dealer. Um, you're going to enter a lot like filling out a 4473 at the dealer. You're going to enter your biographical information as far as who you are, 
uh, what uh, what firearm it is you're buying, what what the serial number is, um, and then you're going to need, uh, in addition to a normal like 4473, you're going to need fingerprints and photographs. And again, a lot of the dealers are, you know, using the cutting edge technology where you can either take your photo right there, or you can take your photo with your smartphone and upload it through their app. Uh, you can get fingerprinted right at their kiosk or their, you know, counter. They'll have a live scan uh, ability to roll your fingerprints and uh, put that into a digital file. And all that gets uploaded with your Form 4. And as you're working through the process in eForms, uh, when you get to the end, you go to pay.gov and you pay your $200 tax right online with your credit card. And uh, all that then gets submitted to the ATF. And then basically they're going to run a normal NICS background check on you. And if it comes back as a proceed, which 70% of the time, uh, people get an auto proceed out of the system, then ATF's going to approve it. And kind of gone are the days of the first in, first out process where you were stuck behind a bunch of other people that had submitted forms for you and were just waiting on a background check response. Now it's pretty uh, pretty instantaneous that when ATF gets back a proceed response from the FBI, they're going to approve your form. And so that's where we're seeing those rapid transfer times that are measured in you know days and in some cases even hours. Um, there's still a handful of people, like I said, that for whatever reason they get that delayed background check. And you know, in the normal Title One world at a gun shop where you're buying a rifle, pistol, or shotgun. Uh, a lot of those are resolved really quickly. Like an FBI NICS uh, examiner looks at him, goes, "Oh yeah, that's that's the wrong Don Smith. He's he's okay," um, and and you never even realize you're delayed, um, and and you get a proceed. But in the case of NFA, ATF will not approve a form until they get that proceed from the FBI. And unfortunately, in the NFA world. The FBI is not under that same kind of three business day shot clock that they have to clear that delayed background check. Otherwise, the transaction can proceed, right? If you're delayed and it's been three business days, barring any state law that prohibit it, prohibits it, the dealer can proceed with the transaction. Under the NFA world, you, those those background checks kind of get set aside and ATI or sorry, FBI works those in just a time available basis. And, uh, and then once those are cleared, then, then you get to proceed. And those are the people that are getting, you know, delayed a little bit longer, but the process itself, back to your original question, the, the process itself for, for buying a suppressor, it's not very hard at all. Um, it just takes a little bit of time and effort and, you know, most dealers now, obviously with an SOT are, are very familiar with the process and it's it's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of technology solutions out there for them to just make that buying process really easy. Yeah, and to piggyback off of what Owen said, which is a fantastic synopsis, um, shout out to two ASA sponsors who really make that process far easier uh, than it used to be. Silencer Shop and Capital Armory, both great options uh, for buying suppressors. Um, and, you know, shameless plug for ASA members, but uh, for you consumers out there listening to this, um, you know, I would say support the companies that are supporting your rights and those two go above and beyond to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a that's a huge thing we see in the gun industry in general is, uh, you know, there, there's some companies who who sacrifice, you know, people's individual constitutionally guaranteed rights for right ends or you know so some money and it's unfortunate and, and you should definitely be looking into to who you're giving your money to uh it's uh it's kind of a big deal uh, there's a couple of companies that are uh you know png'd with me but it is what it is uh absolutely and and before we kind of continue on uh We've got these updated wait times. Uh, there's a lot of great, new, cool, exciting things coming out of the suppressor industry. And one of the things we do here at guns.com is uh, we have a great content team that's dedicated to bringing all of the updates and the news to you guys. So be sure to check out guns.com backslash news. You can see the new releases, uh, new models, and again, a lot of that legislat or legislative uh, updates that are going on with NFA wait times. Um, 
as well as, you know, there's there's even acts out there. People are pushing to pull uh, suppressors off of the NFA. All that kind of stuff you can keep up with at guns.com backslash news. Uh, but I'd like to also kind of address, um, you know, when, when we get into the whole idea of suppressors, what are the kind of sporting uses that you guys see super common for people? um uh, out there in the market what's the reasons that a lot of people go out and get and get suppressors and, and what are the benefits you know there's i think there's a ton but i'd love to hear from you guys like what are the great benefits to having a suppressor for firearms yeah first and foremost the biggest benefit is hearing protection um, right we all know that guns are loud anybody that's been around one understands that it's a, a controlled explosion that's happening very close to you um, the most effective way to protect yourself against that is to reduce the noise at the source. And guys, I'm sorry if that uh, contractor's making some noise, if that's coming through, I hope it's not too bad. Sorry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there are benefits to traditional hearing protection like earmuffs and earplugs, but there are also inherent drawbacks. It's very hard to get a proper seal with either one of those. Um, you're certainly not gonna get what they get in a laboratory setting. Um, so the noise reduction rating or NRR that you see printed on it will generally say anywhere between 20 and 35 decibels, depending on what type of product you're using. Um, the likelihood that you're going to get anywhere even close to that is is almost zero. Um, so, you know, that would basically mean you'd have to be you know completely bald, completely shaven, uh, no hats, no shooting glasses, which most people wear when they shoot. Um, all of these things create small holes when you're talking about using an earmuff. And when it comes to earplugs, um, if you don't have it deeply seated with no uh, holes or gaps, um, you're just not getting complete protection from those. Um, that said, those are tools that should be used in conjunction with suppressors in most instances. You know, if you're out shooting with a 22 uh, subsonic ammo, that kind of stuff, yeah, you can shoot a lot of rounds without um, the need for traditional hearing protection, um, but nobody knows exactly where that threshold is and it's different for everybody, um, right? Like we've all got physiological differences um, you know, certain people are just more predisposed to noise induced hearing loss or tinnitus um, and circumstances can uh, dictate how susceptible you are to it. Um, you know, if you're on certain medications that can have a tremendous impact on your ears ability to absorb sound um, or, you know, get permanently damaged. Um, so there's just so many variables out there and suppressors are really one of the best ways to help mitigate that risk, not just for the person uh, who's shooting or the person who's wearing the protective equipment, but for everybody around them. Um, that's really what sets it apart uh, from, you know, PPE. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, an engineering control that, that mitigates it across the board. Um, you've got some other benefits as well, you know, recoil reduction being one of them. Um, and you combine noise and recoil reduction together. Um, it creates a very good environment for people to get comfortable with shooting. Um, so uh, the impacts that that can have on accuracy are tremendous. Um, you know, most people, when they go to shoot, you really have to train yourself to not react to the bang and the recoil. Um, and I don't know about y'all, but almost every time I accidentally dry fire, meaning I think I've got a round chambered or like, you know, it doesn't actually strike or something like that. A lot of the times I'm flinching. Right. Um, and that's a very natural reaction. But if you shoot suppressed, um, you can really focus more on the fundamentals of shooting uh, without the fear of, you know, this explosion going off near your face and, you know, uh, the, um, the feel of the recoil as well. Um, those are two of the biggest ones for a civilian application. Law enforcement and military folks, you know, also like uh, flash reduction um, and si overall signature reduction. Um, you know, say you're proned out on the ground or there's dust around you, you know, anytime you shoot an unsuppressed gun, there's going to be a tremendous amount of um, you know, materials that get kicked up into the air, um, that's reduced with suppressors as well. Um, but by and large, the, the best, you know, attribute to a suppressor, at least, uh, from my perspective, uh, is the hearing reduction, uh, and noise reduction. Yeah. And I'll, I'll jump in there too. One of the things I think that's, <clears throat> again, 
it's kind of been tossed around and, and, and people don't really know. There's the some folks out there who like to argue online that there's a difference between a silencer and a suppressor. You know, like these are the these are the definitions. And I think one of the reasons why we use the word suppressor is because it suppresses the sound. You know, it doesn't it doesn't silence the sound. And and when I talked about there being that Hollywood video game kind of idea around suppressors, it's still it's still an explosion, right? It's still uh, especially with uh, hyper fast rounds, you still have the supersonic crack and, and hearing protection is always going to be something that you still have to consider even if you're shooting suppressed. Uh, it's not like, you know, James Bond where it's just, you know, it's just, that's not the way that things work. Um, and, and that's kind of one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have around suppressors. Uh, but again, you know, that, that focus being when, when I was talking earlier about some of the pushes that have, have been out there to bring the suppressors off of the NFA, you know, that they're named the Hearing Protection Acts, right? Like the idea is that uh, this is to make the entire sport safer, uh, to, to bring down those decibel levels to, to, you know, like I said, safer levels to where you're not getting permanent hearing damage. Um, and that's a, a huge thing, again, when we're contrasting the way that we look at suppressors and the way that maybe Europe looks at suppressors as it being kind of a, a courteous thing and, and maybe something that a lot of people overlook. It's really easy to be like, oh, like Eager was saying originally, man, you just want to be a, a, an assassin, you know? And it's like, no, man, I just I want to go out and shoot and not like annoy people and also not have to worry about hearing damage, especially for like, I'm sure you guys as well, but you know, me and me and eager here doing a lot of gun reviews, shooting all the time, constantly, uh, you know, or shooting. There's a lot of people out there who are contracting a lot of people who work in law enforcement, things like that. Long periods of shooting where you're on the range constantly. Uh, it's, it's such a, a good, right. just health. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's such a good, like, uh, you know, health benefit to, to have suppressors around, uh, to prevent that long-term damage. Yeah, you look at like hunters, uh, you know, the studies have shown 70 to 80 percent of hunters never wear hearing protection when they're in the field. And, you know, for every what is it knocks every seven years of hunting involvement, you're like five percent more likely to have noise induced hearing loss. I think it's the other way around for every okay, five yeah, years. So, other way around. so for every five years of hunting experience, you're you're seven percent more likely to have noise induced hearing loss. So you look at people that have hunted 25, 30, 40 years plus, uh, you know, most of them have hearing aids, most of them are hard of hearing. Um, and it's because they just never wear that hearing protection in the field. So having a suppressor uh really is going to do a lot to mitigate that for the one or two shots that they're taking uh you know from the tree stand or out in the field um you know again high volume all day on the range shooting a short barrel ar you should probably wear some hearing protection on top of your, <laughs> yeah. your suppressor use but but for the vast majority of people um that are out in the field hunting um a suppressor can do a lot to really protect that hearing it's funny you bring that up because my my brother runs a, a gun shop and I help out every now and then and, and I've worked behind gun shop counters and I've always heard people be like, why would you hunt with a suppressor? You trying to like sneak up on the deer? You don't want the other deer to like hear you shoot? Like it's like, no man, like there's a, there's a purpose behind it. It's not just... I'm not out there trying to be SEAL Team 6 against Bambi. You know, like there's <laughs> there's a real like practical application for for suppressors uh which is another thing that that i'd love to like just kind of push out to people more often is this is not just some hollywood fantasy land thing you know this is a real tool um and again like eager was saying this goes hand in hand with your uh you know your constitutional right like this is your constitutional right to exercise the second amendment gives you that chance to uh <clears throat> you know to bear arms and this goes along with that Yep. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Think about it too. Like hearing is one of our five senses, right? And there's so many dudes that go out and hunt people in general, they'll go out and hunt and like think that they can like macho their way through hearing loss. And that's just not a thing. Imagine if like, you were like, Hey, like if you pull this trigger, you have a pretty high likelihood of losing your vision. How many people would pull that trigger? Right? Like very few, right? Like you put the shooting glasses on, okay. Or do whatever you need to do to protect yourself from it. But so many people think that they can just like, you know, muscle their way through. And it's just not how that works. Um, and like part of it is just a lot of ignorance on the topic, right? Like, you know, good, um, you know, hearing protection. Uh, it's something that we all get kind of taught and largely ignore. 
um, you know, when we're coming up. But I think that we've got a unique opportunity now with this next generation of shooters to expose them to the shooting sports in a way where they don't have to make those same sacrifices that, you know, our generation did or our parents' generation certainly did um, going into it. It really is kind of a new day for a lot of people, except for the folks that are in the eight states where they're currently banned, you know, but we are working on that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it like, I, I don't, I don't know why people don't care more about their hearing. Yeah, hundred percent. Once you lose it, you're not getting it back. And my dad was a fighter pilot, and uh, he had the absolute best hearing protection that the United States government uh, was able to procure to the lowest bidder. That's the, the caveat <laughs> there. But uh, you know, he, he can't. His his hearing's terrible now, and it's it's a debilitating thing, especially when you're in a social setting and you're older. You can get hearing aids, but they get overloaded. You know, and and there's nothing that beats your natural ability, your God-given ability to hear. Uh, and that's a, a, a largely important thing uh, that, that, again, like you said, it's just, it's not even really discussed. Most people who talk about suppressors, that's not one of the top, you know, discussion points that we hit is uh, is the importance or the impact on actual health that it can have. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, you know, I've been, been hunting and shooting and stuff for more than 40 years. And I remember back in the old days, you know, I, I started hunting when I was like 11, you know, and I'd been, I'd had a 22 for years before that. And uh, the only time I ever saw uh, hearing protection was like, the, I remember the first time I, I like was given some and expected to use it on the range was uh, when I was in like JROTC in high school, which was years later. And that was back when we had 22s in JROTC. They don't, they don't do that anymore. I think it's all air rifles now. But, you know, they, they gave you hearing protection. I was like, Burr? you know, it's like a, a foreign concept. And at that time in my life, I was only like, you know, I was a high school kid, but I'd, I'd already spent years and years and years shooting and it, it never touched uh, any any sort of, of PPE, you know, involving uh, hearing protection, you know. And then I remember uh, I was in my, my early 20s and I was moonlighting in a, a, a big sporting goods store. It was a local sporting goods store, not a, not a big box. And, you know, we had racks and racks of shotguns and shotgun shells and waders and rifles and pistols and all sorts of stuff. But, you know, our hearing protection area was about like this big, you know, it had like some foamies and like some some psychedelic looking disco muffs, you know, and, and that was it. And nobody came in looking for them, you know, so they, they literally got dust on it because people would only use it on the range sometimes and nobody would ever use it hunting. And so today I always have a, a low pitch tinnitus, you know, and I have like 70% hearing loss in my left ear with like perforated eardrums and stuff. So, uh, and don't get me wrong, I, I worked industrial jobs and listened to loud music and ran lawn doors and stuff as well, you know, so I'm not just, oh, it was the guns that did it. But, you know, I, I'm sure if I would have had hearing protection and or suppressors and whatnot, I, I probably wouldn't have to read lips as much, you know, in a social setting or, you know, do the whole like, uh, would you what was that? I'm sorry, come again, you know. And then when I still can't hear it the second time, I'll just be like, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> I, I wind up getting yeah. roped into all kinds of stuff because I can't hear people and I'm just agreeable. I'm like, oh, next thing yeah, I know, yeah, that was in somebody's house, you know. <laughs> that was a wake up call for me. I remember standing at an industry event, you know, it might have been an aisle auction or something, but there were like the titans of our industry, right? The biggest names in big box stores and distributors and, and, firearm parts dealers and and i mean these were these were people that you would recognize their names and i looked around and every last one of them was wearing hearing aids because they've had just a lifetime they grew up in the industry you know their parents and their grandparents started these businesses and they grew up in this industry shooting and hunting and as they're all getting into their 60s 70s 80s they're all wearing hearing aids because same thing again 70 to 80 percent of hunters never wear hearing protection and suppressors were a much smaller smaller segment than they are now unless you were you know hunting big game in africa or you know hunting up in the nordic countries or something where suppressor use was common 
Yeah, and I I'm 28, and I still have to watch movies with captions, you know. So like it's already it's already started, and and uh, I do think a lot of that has to do with how much we've shot. But before we get into that, uh, one of our sponsorships here is uh, the Guns.com We Buy Guns program. We here at Guns.com have tried to virtualize the pawn shop process, make everything super easy and online. If you're looking to sell your firearm, maybe pick up something new or Maybe you need to fund yourself a new suppressor project. Um, you can go to guns.com and click on the sell your gun tab. Uh, you'll enter in some information, submit that. We'll uh, send you an offer if you like that offer. We'll send you everything you need to ship it to us. Drop it off at a UPS drop location. Once we receive it and inspect it, we'll pay you out by check or direct deposit and then you can go out there and get yourself a can because everybody should have a can uh, moving a little bit past some of the benefits and the history the thing i'd really like to kind of end on is where the industry is now uh, the massive jump and increase in manufacturers uh you know products uh, and as well as just big companies getting more involved with uh, suppressor ownership in general and where you kind of see things going. I mean, I think it's an exciting time. There's so much technology that's available now that's getting implemented with a lot of the suppressor designs. I know we had spent some time out with uh, with SIG and I know they have they have a can that I think, if I remember the story correctly, they spent like hundreds of thousands of dollars at MIT working on their supercomputers designing and it has less back pressure than an unsuppressed AR. Uh, so like all kinds of super cool technologies that are coming out these days with suppressors. And like I said, it seems like these uh, companies, you know, back 10, 15 years ago, you had a handful. Now it's like everybody and, and their mother is either starting a company or it's a big company that's starting a, a section. Uh, I always joke with Eager, it's just a matter of time before Palmetto State starts making suppressors. But, uh, you know, it just seems like it's, it's, the, it's the growing thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we've been keeping track of the numbers since, uh, you know, as long as ATF has been publishing them. And you look at like the annual Form 4 volume. And again, Form 4s cover suppressors, but they also cover short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, AOWs, transferable machine guns, things like that. But by and large, uh, for the last eight years or so, suppressors account for 90% or more of all the Form 4s going into ATF. And, you know, it was a small number. I think ATF data goes all the way back to 1990 when you had about 7,000 Form 4s that went in the whole year. Um, and then those numbers dropped off for a couple of years and then kind of started to even out. But all through the 90s, it was under 10,000 Form 4s. And then up through the early aughts and even really until ASA started, you were only about 30,000 Form 4s a year at most and uh last year there were over 400,000 form 4s that were submitted uh this year progress. with the fast what's that progress yeah yeah totally um you know this year with these fast transfer times ATF uh told us they're receiving about 14 to 16,000 form 4s a week i mean that's that's more Form 4s in a week than we're getting submitted in a year up until 2005. Um, and we yeah. saw a pretty significant jump as these transfer times really dropped off and sped up. Um, February's numbers jumped almost 80, a little over 80% in Form 4 volume in a month's time. Um, they went from like 43,000 in January up to almost 80,000 Form 4s just in the month of February. Um, it tapered off a little bit into March, and I think a lot of that was more supply chain related. I think they were selling so many suppressors, the manufacturers had a tough time keeping up. Um, and Form 3 times out to dealers and distributors uh, got a little bit longer for a short period. And so it, uh, I think that's why it tapered off. We'll see what April brings, if we can get the numbers from ATF. Um, but yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, this is, this is historical again, the last 20 plus years that I've been both a consumer and in the industry, uh, we've never seen anything like it. And so we're, we're on track. We, we could see 
close to a million form fours this year if this pace keeps up and that would be wild which puts us in a very good position to make the argument that these are in common use you know, I love yeah. that you you bring that up because the the last thing that I was gonna gonna really talk about is me and Eager have discussed the term and the importance of common use and, and common use is really uh, a a thing that can absolutely be applied to suppressors at this point and uh, you know that's again it goes back to you you have your you know creator endowed rights as an American citizen guaranteed to you by the by the Constitution and how important that is. Um, and this goes hand in hand with that, um, you know, with that Second Amendment, right? I mean, there's still what, like seven states that, you know, there's no consumer ownership allowed, you know, at all, even if the, you have a, a ATF approved and, you know, properly registered uh, suppressor, you still can't own it in, in several states and several large states, you know, New York and California and, you know, stuff like that, which is, is just a travesty, I think, you know. Um, and ideally, I'd, I'd love to see something like the Hearing Protection Act, you know, finally go through and then it's just like it's like a, a Title One, you know, transfer, like you're just transferring a, a you know, 12 gauge shotgun to somebody. You don't have to do all the uh, fingerprints and photographs and stuff as long as you can clear your next check, you're good, you know, uh, and, and hopefully that'll that'll happen one day. And this is all kind of. Uh, where common use and millions and millions of suppressors floating around out there, you know, uh, kind of is heading, correct? I mean, or am I just missing the, the, the whole uh, aspect here? Yeah, I mean, there's so it's it's pretty multifaceted. Um, Hearing Protection Act is a bill that we wrote in 2015 and helped revise in 2017. Um, like, the truth of the matter with HPA is that it's going to take several congressional cycles before that's a viable bill, just based on the current political landscape, right? Like for us to get it uh, signed into law, we have to have a president who's willing to sign it. We don't have that right now. Um, we've got to have a house that's willing to pass it. Even must pass bills are having a hard time in, in the you know razor thin Republican majority chamber right now. Uh, and we're gonna to have to have 60 votes in the Senate. Um, and I just don't see that occurring any time in the near future. Um, hopefully at some point th those stars do align, at which point, you know, we've got, we don't have three or 4 million suppressors in circulation. We've got 20 or 30 or 40 million at that point, you know, oh. and like, it's a completely different ball game, but that is at this point, a long-term play. Um, when we wrote it in 2015, uh, Matt Salmon, a retired member from Arizona, he was the one that introduced it. And our original plan was that that was going to be a five to 10 year time horizon. We didn't think Trump was going to get elected. We didn't think the Republicans were going to have the majorities that they did in both chambers. Uh, so after that election in November 16, it was like, oh, man, like we actually have a window. So we really hit the gas on it then. Um, but, um, you know, we've got to take our lessons from like, hey, what went wrong with that? Uh, there were some negative impacts on industry or at least perceived negative impacts from HBA, um, you know, it, but uh, so we've got to take those lessons and apply those moving forward. Um, but you know, I don't want consumers to think that like HPA is something that, you know, hey, if Donald Trump gets elected in November, they're like, we're going to get suppressors taken out of the NFA. There's a lot more to it than that. Sure. Um, that is still our top organizational priority, um, but it's just not a short term uh, like reality right now. That said, um, at the state level, uh, there's currently eight states where they're prohibited. So like your kind of hit list of anti-gun states, Hawaii, California, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Delaware, uh, and uh, Massachusetts. 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 Yeah. yeah um, which is so, it's funny because you've got YHM in Massachusetts, yeah. you know, so it's yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. And those guys are fantastic, man. Like the, the Grams are, are some of my favorite people in this industry and they make some awesome product. Uh, but I mean, they're just kind of held captive in that state. Um, but we've got a lawsuit actually going through the ASA Foundation, which is a 501c3 wing of ASA. Um, and we're suing the state of Illinois. Um, we teamed up with Silencer Shop. They cut us a $350,000 check to file that lawsuit. Um, and we hired the best team of legal minds in the country, um, Cooper and Kirk. Uh, these guys have extensive experience at appellate and Supreme Court level litigation. Um, we are expecting work back on that any day. Um, right, we're we're in the window where we thought that the judge would have issued a ruling already, um, but any day now that could come out. Um, and the basis of that lawsuit is challenging the constitutionality of a statewide ban on suppressors 
uh, saying that with the new standard of review from Bruin, that it is a direct infringement upon a constitutional right. Um, if we're successful, that will be an absolute game changer for suppressors. Um, and one that we hope to be able to apply to other states through additional lawsuits and ultimately hopefully getting the Supreme Court to weigh in on it. Yeah, it's crazy because, you know, you hear the, the numbers from Owen and you really think about it. And I think that it's really easy in the gun industry to, to write off states like California. There's huge firearm ownership in California. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. could you there, imagine if, yeah, can, can you imagine if California gets on board with, with uh, you know, suppressors and, uh, you know, kind of <clears throat> getting towards the end here. You know, I think the thing that I'd love to, to really press, and I'm sure you guys as well, is, is you know, it's, it's a battle of inches and we got to fight one inch at a time. Uh, and, and you can't, you know, the, the, the HPA is a great thing to, to strive for, but that, that's more of like the end zone and, and we're still fighting at the 50 yard line. Um, and we got to keep kind of pushing forward. And it's super important to be involved. You know, when we're talking about the second amendment, it's not just our, our rights, but it's also our responsibility to, to uphold those rights and take the time to, to write our, our senators to support companies that do support your your ownership that support your second amendment right and uh, also to get involved with organizations like asa uh, that are out there you know fighting battles and it's super easy to be like man i live here and suppressors are legal what do i care about illinois but for the grand scheme of things it's huge and, and you know as an american i want every single american to have their you know creator endowed rights respected by the the government like and and it's such a great thing to to get to talk to guys like you um and, and get involved with organizations like this to see you on the front lines you know fighting for people's rights really want to thank you guys for coming on and and discussing this with us and uh we uh we hope we can keep a, a pretty tight working relationship here going forward but uh but thank you both for for this yeah thanks for having us yeah, thank you all, man. And guns.com has been incredibly good to us. Chris, you, you, I don't think I've ever told you this straight up, but you're my favorite writer in the industry, man. Um, <laughs> every time we've, we've had something to push out, you've been Johnny on the spot. Um, and I mean, shoot, we've been working together for what, over 10 years at this point. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Chris is my spirit animal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, absolutely, and and we we really appreciate you guys. Um, just to to close everything out, cannot stress enough. You know, it it is your right. Uh, be sure to exercise your rights. Uh, don't don't squabble them away. You know, sometimes you got to fight for those to maintain those. And is that the right word? Yeah, squabble. That works. Uh, no, but uh, it's yeah, it's your you right. Use the word. Yeah. You yeah. squander them, but you squander, you squabble, squabble, well, whatever. Just argue about it. Yeah. yeah. I was home learned it in Alabama. So, <laughs> uh, no, seriously though, it's, you know, it's something that, that we all kind of have to keep on our toes about. Uh, but don't let anybody bully you out of your rights. Um, that's that's just so important. So we want to thank uh, ASA for coming on here. Knox, Owen, thank you guys so much. And uh, for me and Mr. Chris Eager, for the Two Guys, One Gun podcast, this is uh, us signing off. We'll catch you on the next episode.